Good evening, ladies and gentlemen from Victoria to Halifax, Yellowknife to Windsor, Canada. It is a pleasure to have you with us this evening, as it is a pleasure to have Mr. Jason Prince. Uh, lecturer, Glad to be here. Lecturer at the University of Concordia, Concordia University, pardon me, in Montreal, and um, author, um, all around good activist and, uh, and pushing for, uh, for more affordable and accessible transit solutions across the country and better, you know, kind of rational urban planning. So um, just a quick rundown of where, we, where we're at and what we're doing. We're moving into a little bit of a uh, more of a conversational tone with our, um, our uh, broadcasts. Uh, so uh, to keep, put you all in context, the Climate Reality Project Canada running these events as part of our Climate Hub initiative. At climatehub.ca, you will find resources to take action in your community. And uh, we are uh, really excited to be moving into a season of competition between cities as part of the uh, National Climate League initiative. So at the moment, cities across the country, about 20 cities are participating in collecting uh, indicators spanning um, from, uh, in the case of this evening's broadcast, uh, public transit uh, ridership numbers to affordable housing to help stem urban sprawl and provide uh, uh, dignified living conditions for people, uh, people in cities across Canada um, to things like walkability, um, to uh, tree canopy cover, landfill waste, tons of waste produced per, uh, per household um, in a city. And the idea being in December, when the final report is published, which will look a little bit like this, the standings of the National Climate League, um, when that report is published during COP24 in December, we will um, celebrate the cities in Canada that are moving uh, forward uh, quickly or the, the, the top cities moving forward on uh, these uh, climate solutions while improving the quality of life of their citizens. So with all that said, um, again, here, Climate Reality Canada, we thank uh, very much Desjardins and uh, CN and the David Suzuki Foundation for their support uh, as we continue to push for uh, carbon neutral Canada and reducing emissions, particularly um, through the Climate Hub Initiative and at the uh, municipal level. So all that said, I would like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Jason Prince, and uh, him and I go back a couple of years. I'm gonna share very briefly a graphic that uh, illustrates exactly uh, how Jason and I first uh, got connected. And you will see that he is part of, uh, in Montreal, what we call the Montreal Climate Coalition, which is the, uh, the Climate Hub here in Montreal. And the objective of Climate Hubs across the country is to rally diverse citizens, as you see here, uh, people who represent the architecture community, the religious communities, Buddhists, Jewish community, Muslims, Christians, um, uh, environmental groups, finance professionals, and in the case of Mr. Uh, Prince here, where have I left you? There you are. Uh, he wrote a, a document uh, uh, on behalf of transit riders, on behalf of people who were sick of waiting, you know, 30 minutes for a bus in the cold, or uh, sick of um, uh, breakdowns in the subway system that cost them, you know, uh, missing a meeting at work, what have you. So he wrote a document as part of a public consultation. So the Montreal Climate Coalition brought together these diverse voices with the explicit objective to uh, push the city to set a 400th anniversary uh, objective for carbon neutrality. So that's 2042 in the case of Montreal. So two pieces of this that are important to remember, uh, one being that the objective that we're asking hubs to set for their cities are specific to their cities. It's unique to their city. It's a vision for their own city. In one city, it might be one date. In another city, it might be another date. You might choose 100% renewable. You might choose carbon neutrality. The idea is transition and transition in a way that is uh, uh, that resonates with the political reality of your city. Um, so in Montreal, that, that declaration or those um, uh, those 36 um, documents, those briefs that were submitted to a public consultation ended up developing a, a common declaration of 400th anniversary carbon neutrality, including four uh, principal recommendations, those being uh, uh, carbon budget for the city, uh, annual emissions inventories, um, 
climate test for major infrastructure, public transit, among others, and finally, uh, really deep citizen participation throughout the process. So uh, this declaration was signed by our mayor here um, a few months ago, and now we're in the process of making it uh, a reality, implementing, pushing towards uh, the implementation of uh, carbon neutrality in the next 25 years, uh, 24 years now. So uh, with that all said, I would like to cede the floor to Jason Prince, who will give a, a presentation of his most recent uh, publication, uh, that being uh, Free Public Transit um, and Why We Don't Pay to Ride Elevators. So here you have very quickly exactly what that looks like. And uh, Jason, I will invite you to take it away. All right, thank you for that backdrop. Uh, so Matthew, that's the, that's the first edition. Oh, I've been told I have to keep waving my hand to make sure the lights don't turn off. We're in a very, a zero carbon building, <clears throat> a platinum lead building here in downtown Montreal, the Maison de Développement de Hab. Uh, so I have to keep, if I start gesticulating, you know why, because I've got to keep moving to keep the lights on. That's how super efficient this building is. I'd like to start with a quote from a, a prof, an old professor of mine from McGill University. Uh, I happened to stumble on this just this afternoon when I was reading a paper, and I thought I'd just read it out to start to kick it off. Here, here Jean Wolfe, wonderful, charismatic, very funny lady, much loved by all of her students and much loved in Montreal and really across Canada, very well-known urban planning director at the School of Urban Planning for many years, <clears throat> said, sustainable development is easier to imagine than the political processes required for implementation in 2004. And that's the opening uh, quote from a chapter in a book, a very, a very good book that I'm in the middle of reading. And I think, although it sounds kind of, who, who likes sustainable development? It's a, it's a contradiction in terms, right? I think some of us understand that. However, so to the degree that that means anything at all, getting to, to the, we have this aspirational language you've just described, Matthew, about uh, a carbon neutral city in 2040, 2050, getting the political processes uh, to implement that is a fantastically complicated process. So the book actually is, a, you could say it's, it's, like, it's like, a, a, like an opening salvo for a dramatic step in the right direction. Free public transport in a big city would clearly signal that this city is gonna put resources towards a real, perhaps a silver bullet in some areas of, the, uh, of our economy, areas which are highly dependent on uh, transportation, but also uh, have already pretty good renewable resources for all the other sectors. It represents an enormous, a uh, step in the right direction. If you were to eliminate the price barrier, some people say. You, it can't be done alone. It would have to be coupled with massive investment in new infrastructure. So reserve bus lanes, clear priority for buses on the surface uh, in moving people around in the region. Uh, and uh, a clear uh, financial operating budget, financial priorities for uh, and for the increased um, volume of people that would be moving now in the city. Uh, in, Mo in Montreal right now, we have about 2,000 buses operating and we have a metro system with a, several dozen stations. In that, uh, in that public um, uh, consultation document that I prepared that Matthew made reference to, I did the calculations on what it would cost to double the number of of metro stations and double the number of buses and the drivers that went along with it. And it would cost about $27 billion for the Montreal region in capital costs alone. And the operating budget would be significant. The additional cost to the city would be significant. It would represent several times the capital budget of our city in one go. So it's, it's an ass, it's, it's, it, you know, it, and it would take that kind of major investment in order to really push out a new way of moving people at a regional level, at a regional scale in, in a big city like Montreal, two, three million people. So what is the best example right now on planet Earth 
for free public transport system, a completely free public transport system. Uh, the biggest city we have right now is the city of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, uh, which several years ago made that decision. It was not an idea that came out of the left wing, and it was, it, but it was a left, it was actually a right wing party idea. Of course, the right wing and the left wing in Estonia are quite different, former communist country, uh, than, it, than it is certainly in the United States or even Canada. But uh, it, it was uh, the, 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 part, the political party that brought forward the, the, the model in, in uh, Estonia and Tallinn was a, was, a, was a middle party, was the, you know, one of those uh, liberal type parties, not a left wing party and not a right wing party. So uh, it's interesting to note that. <clears throat> and now free public transport that is free at all times to all people uh, in the city for at least a year as a, as the, as a definition. There are hundreds operating systems in the world right now. Uh, most of them are in Europe. Uh, there are a few, uh, there are about 25 or 30 in the United States. Many of them are college towns or tourist destination towns where the public transport is, is completely free at all times and for all, all users. Uh, so now, so let's, let's distinguish completely free systems like these from the ones where free public transport is being used as a, as a public policy tool to try and shape behaviors or to achieve public policy uh, targets. For example, if you're trying to relieve poverty from in your city, you might choose to make it free for children of families or for low income people or for senior citizens who are typically low income on fixed income. So you might use it to, to try and correct uh, income disparities in a city, at a city level. Or you might use it to try and uh, change people's behavior. So for example, it might be free at rush hour in the morning to try and get people to leave their cars behind. It might be free on a particular line or in a particular area in the downtown core, for example, famously, uh, that city up there, Portland, up in the Northwest of the United States, that glowing, shiny example of good urban planning. They had free public transport in the downtown for many, many years. Recently, it's been, it's been, uh, it's, 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 they've added a price to it. Or, or there might be a line that's free or free on the weekends sometimes. All right, so, so we, we can see uh, free public transport as a way of trying to achieve certain public policy goals. But let's come back to Estonia. What's, what's funny about Estonia is that when they brought it in, uh, th they made it free for the citizens of the city of Estonia. And of course there are suburbs around, uh, around Tallinn um, uh, that are, are, were not where it was not free, you're not, it's not free. So those people who lived in those suburban areas actually moved into Tallinn in order to take advantage of the free public transport. And in fact, the tax base in, increased to the point where Tallinn came out economically ahead. They had more taxes after implementing free public transport than they had before. It was a net economic benefit for the city of Tallinn. Now that, in that particular city, probably uh, 70 or 80 percent of the of the operations of the public transport system were paid already by taxes so it was a very small margin in the city of toronto for example it's 70 percent paid by the users the most expensive the highest user fee in a public transport system in north america is in toronto montreal it's about 50 50 so you have to in order to you have to look at each situation carefully before you decide about how far you can go and how much it's going to cost and what the political opportunities are but it's, uh, so the, the book, the book uh, is actually a collection of, of self-standing essays of examples of different kinds of struggles. So we have these uh, municipal-led uh, struggles like the one in Tallinn. Uh, it was a, a brought out of a political party and implemented without any public consultation. It was really a, a visionary uh, idea of the mayor. Um, and and, and there, was, there was, it was no public process involved in that particular one. Um, but in other places, it, it, you know, it, it, we, we have struggles to try and achieve uh, free public transport that are coming out of the, the grassroots. Uh, so, for example, in some areas of the United States, you see um, in uh, San Francisco and in, and in Los Angeles, even in New York City, people are calling for free public transport or they're taking direct action to try and uh, people are, are using direct action to try and not, uh, not pay for public transport as a way of correcting social injustice and also in, in the context of racialized treatment by minorities, by the police and by the authorities. So there, there, we, we have these different contexts in which public, free public transport is being, is being 
used, uh, if you want, uh, or um, uh, in, in contexts in which we see efforts to try and reduce the cost of transport in cities. If people have any questions about any of these examples I'm giving, uh, you can certainly ask questions in, in the um, later on in the podcast. Yeah, I, think by, I, um, by I did texting. fail to mention that. I did fail to mention that, but it, you are also most welcome to uh, contribute questions as we go along, either in the chat or the Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom of your screens, and we will address those uh, as we go along. Uh, I think we, uh, Jason is very open to having kind of a, a dialogue as opposed to, uh, yeah, kind of separate uh, sections. Yeah. So, so right now, free public transport can be seen as, as, as achieving perhaps a, a tool that could be achieve, used to achieve two great challenges of the 21st century. One is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And in Montreal, it would be quite dramatic. Something like 60 per 70 percent of our 65 percent of our greenhouse gases are in the transport sector in the Montreal region, according to some studies. It's a bit less according to other studies. It's hard to get a, a bead on that. But certainly the, the best data for all of Quebec is about 35 percent. It's still a major chunk of our greenhouse gases um, that and in, in transportation. Um, so it, it, it can be a tool for achieve, helping cities to achieve dramatic uh, greenhouse gas targets reductions. Um, and it can also be used to correct, uh, to cr create a bit more of a, of a socially just city. So uh, as a way of reducing uh, the cost for low income people and, and, uh, and achieving what, what in one chapter is called the right uh, to the city and the right to, to transportation. The, let me, I'll finish, I'll finish with this and then Matthew, you can ask me some questions and clarifications. We can have more of a conversation. I'll just end, end with this thought. Uh, in, in, in our city, in Montreal, and in every city, we, we have public, publicly owned and free assets that are made available to the people in the population, right? So, for example, in Montreal, we have a magnificent central library at the intersection of two or three metro stations, uh, three metro lines, in fact, right? The, the belly button of Montreal, uh, the National uh, Library. We also have M Mount Royal Park, famous park, absolutely free for anybody who wants to go there at all times. Uh, we have free museum days. We have incredible summer festivals that are go on with lots of stuff for free. Circus, uh, jazz, all these things have free, free things going on in them for the population. The only challenge is, of course, you have to get there. So to get to the library with your family, it can cost $20 or $30 to get there and get back, uh, bring back your books. So that, that, makes it, that price makes that asset un unachievable, unavailable to a, lar a large number of people in the city, low-income people, can't easily get, get to, the, to, the, to the public parks that are, too, that are too far away, can't get to all these free things going on in the city. So the, the, the right to the city and the, and the, and the access to these uh, amazing assets that our cities produce with our taxes is severely limited. So free public transport uh, clarifies also this access question. Uh, quite dramatically, so I'll leave. I'll leave it at that. Matthew, you've got any questions for me? I'm I'm now ready to uh, answer. Superb. I have plenty of questions. I will, of course, encourage our uh, audience to post their questions in the Q and A and the chat feature. I'm sure there are many. Um, I'm going to try to start with one that might not be the most obvious question, and hopefully leave some of the more uh, low hanging fruit to our uh, to our audience. Um, and that is to pick up. Yeah, keep your uh, just yeah. Keep, keep moving. Uh, and that question is uh, just with respect to that last uh, point you made about the right to the city. Yes. Now, this is an internationally recognized uh, right in many circles. Um, uh, can you describe it a little bit uh, in more depth and how um, being able to uh, transit around the city should be um, a right as well? Well, it's not. It's not a. It's not an accepted right. It's there are struggles to 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 to. It's a. It's an umbrella concept. It has its roots in in uh, in, uh, in philosophers in the nineteen sixties and seventies, uh, and it's 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 now the centerpiece of many uh, urban political movements. Uh, in, for example, Mexico City and many uh, cities around the world in emerging economies. Uh, in the global south, we, we, we see uh, political movements around the right to the city, but it is not uh, one that has been achieved yet. Uh, it, 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 there is no, there's no, um, there's no set of principles around the right to the city. There are, there are charters now. I'm not an expert in the right to the city, but there are several uh, charters similar to the one that we have adopted here in Montreal, the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities. 
It was adopted about 15 years ago. It was a, an, an early example. We have these kinds of charters that establish and try to codify rights to the city and define the parts of that. But these are, you know, they're not constitutional documents. They're guiding the aspirational documents at best. Uh, and and they, they, they allow people to rally under and, uh, and, and collectively uh, lobby for, uh, certain, for certain goods. As I say, I'm not an expert in the right to the city. Uh, so anybody who's listening can perhaps correct me if I've made any factual errors. I think perhaps the, the, the Mexico City might be one of the places to go and look for examples of uh, right to the city based charters that are, that are being adopted. Perfect. But I know that there are at least a half a dozen others. <clears throat> Great. Yeah. Um, I know that the United Cities and Local Governments, uh, UCLG, yeah. uh, is the international organization, I believe, who is championing uh, the adoption or the uh, enshrinement of the right to the city at the UN level. So I think in, in certain international circles, it's, it's considered like just a, I wouldn't want to say a, an inevitability, but they are, you know, trying to make it um, uh, they're on their way to building momentum behind uh, behind seeing that happen. In as a concrete example in Montreal, and this issue comes up frequently in my discussions with um, uh, folks here trying to push for a carbon neutral city, is how do citizen groups, how do how does civil society um, have a real voice at the table? Uh, frequently, what's happened, uh, what happens is a public consultation will be held and will say, "Here's a project. What do you think about it?" Conversely. What the right to the city allows us to do in Montreal because of the charter of rights and responsibilities of Montreal citizens, which is unique to this city um, uh, in, in a Canadian context anyways, uh, allows citizens to say, we're not going to wait to be consulted. Rather, we're going to take the initiative of our own volition to say, we want to have a say in this thing that's happening or in that thing that should be happening. And that allows us as citizens to reappropriate re our or assert our citizenship uh, in another way. So that's an interesting way in which um, uh, citizens could potentially use the right to the city. Oh, um, I've got to wave my hand around here. Yes, indeed. Yes. <laughs> um, so two questions uh, here um, popping up from so, Toronto. Uh, Mr. Bruce uh, Nagy, uh, Nagy, pardon me. Uh, firstly, what does transit normally cost a user for one trip in Montreal, and how would the city fund the initiative if free transit uh, of free transit in in a case like Montreal? Where would that money come from? And I think that's a pretty fair and uh, common question. That's a fair question. Yeah. So, so it costs a single user. I think it's around three twenty five now. It might have gone up a little tiny bit uh, for a single bus ticket in one direction. It gives you access to the network for about two hours, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, so family uh, you, of four, you could find yourself quite easily. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah you have to go, go to the library and get back again. So you've got to figure all that out. Now there are free times currently in Montreal. Uh, it's free for kids on the weekends under twelve if they're with an adult, um, and it's free in the summertime for kids under twelve. So that means eleven and under. Um, and uh, so that does take a, a little bit of uh, the sting out if you can if you want to go to the the park, for example, on a weekend or in the summertime. Uh, so, so, you know, there are, as I say, pu free public transport, fully free, is only implemented about a f in about 100 cities, but there are probably thousands of examples of, of partially free public transport that are being, that are implemented uh, here and there. Um, so, but come back to the second question, which is a dynamite question. We, the STM, so one of the, one of the, uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure how many transport authorities are in the Montreal region, they're currently being, re you know, they're, they've, they're being, they've been restructured. But still, the STM, which covers uh, the responsibilities of transportation in the city of Montreal, uh, it costs, if I'm not mistaken, about 500, the users pay about $550 million a year into the operation. It's about half of the operating budget. And so uh, so that's the pr that would be the price that we would have to, that would be the, the subsidy we'd have to come up with. 550 million a year, every year, forever, if we were going to make it free in Montreal. And so where would that, where would that come 10%, from? That represents about 10% of the city's current budget of approximately five, uh, five upwards, uh, just over $5 billion. Yeah. So we, 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 we would have to look at a place like the carbon cap and trade system as a source of financing. Right now we have 
uh, uh, several hundred million dollars sitting in, in the cap and trade budget. And the cap and trade budget is, is, is earmarked for uh, green initiatives, the green fund that goes through something called the green fund in, in Quebec. And, and uh, currently it has, it, we, we, we don't have enough projects to, uh, to, to spend that money on uh, that, that, that will achieve uh, the targets of the fund. So we've ended up spending it on strange things like uh, pipeline improvements and things like that. It's very paradoxical things. Um, the, the Green Fund, uh, there's been some press on how the Green Fund is actually being spent. So we, if we were to take that Green Fund and put it directly into Montreal, uh, that could be a major source. We've been talking in Montreal for quite a long time on different kinds of funding uh, for public transport. A dedicated a tax on the bridges. A, uh, a special tax dedicated to uh, car users. Uh, there are taxes on the kilometers traveled. There are uh, there are a handful of, of financial instruments that have been seriously discussed in Montreal for the past years, and it, it, you know nobody wants to see new taxes. Uh, the green fund is probably the least it would be the least painful one for the drivers, but ultimately it's about setting in in place the right pricing strategies. That's the basic idea here between dropping the price of free, free public transport and, and increasing the price of other forms of private transport. The idea, the basic idea behind it is bonus malice. You, you, you have to pay more for the evil things, the bad things, and, and you pay less for the good things. And if you set the pricing structure right at the region level, the market will follow. People will make the right decisions. Uh, so th that's, the, that's the, the master public policy instrument that I'm trying to describe here. And I think the book is suggesting. Terrific, yeah. A point um, this morning that was made uh, in a meeting with the director of transportation of Montreal that I was uh, that I was sitting in on uh, was that the new the new um, entity, the ARTM, that is the Regional Transit Authority, similar to Metrolinx in Toronto, uh, um, similar in certain respects. Yes, 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 uh, and different in other respects. Quite different. The, this new transit authority will be um, consulting, quote unquote, the population on, uh, on its vision for the next 20 years. And what's not on the table when they do that consultation uh, is that question of free public transit or the question of reducing transit fees over the long run. And that's uh, inherent in consultations that tend to happen. Uh, they they will limit the scope of what is allowable in terms of discussion. And I think that's um, indicative of how consultations are framed right now. It's basically, you have purview over these decisions. You can choose the color of the buses that are going to be um, you know, circulating on your roads, for example, or you know, in some cases you can adjust the routes slightly, but anything fundamental, anything foundational, is is off the table. Sorry about the, well, the noise. Well, let, let me let me briefly respond. Back in 2012 in Montreal, we had a very large and very uh, uh, energetic consultation on how to finance public transport, and it was it was following uh, the adoption of the PMAD, our regional plan, around the same time, and there were again hundreds of briefs were submitted to that. And I read through them when I was putting together the book. I read through to see if there was any serious discussion at the time in, Montreal, in the Montreal public consultation on how to finance mass transit. And, and nobody was talking about free public transport at that point. There was one brief that I found where they talked about, uh, you know, something resembling that. There's, there has, it really hasn't been any talk about this. This book actually helped to focus um, the, uh, the attention on the question. And since the book came out, actually, there have been quite a few people raising the question. I mean, it, it, the book wasn't the first, uh, first time. Tallinn was probably the first city where, you know, and, and they started to market the, the, the thing some years ago. It, out of um, Berlin, there's been a, quite a lot of attention uh, on, on, on documenting, and all that, all that work, by the way, came into the book. I, I, I co-edited the book with Judith Delheim uh, at, uh, at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Berlin. And she had done all of the research on the different kinds of movements that are in place right now. Um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the thing, uh, uh, the, the proposal for free public transport came out of one of the, uh, a, a very prominent activist and lawyer and one of the 1% one of the, 1 of the 1% uh, in New York City <clears throat> came out with a free public transport proposal some years ago, well before the book was published. 
Um, so, you know, so it's something that now and again leaps into the public imagination. What's fascinating is that wherever free public transport is implemented, it's immediately extremely politically popular. People love it. And the number of people who are riding public transport immediately goes up. Often 50% is the ballpark, is the ballpark you can expect to have after a, a first elan, you know, after a first, uh, oh, everybody's going to ride for free for a little while. It's a bit chaotic. And then it settles in about a 50% increase on what you had before. And if you continue to make improvements, you can get more and more, you can harvest, harvest more and more people out of their cars and bicycles and walking uh, to take public transport. That, by the way, was a statement that should lead to a good question. <clears throat> I'm so expecting. Remind, I'll remind, we have had a few people that have joined actually since we started the question period. Uh, so if anybody would like to drop questions in the Q&A section, there's one more there. Um, is it possible to make it free for just those under a certain income level? Can that be, can you know, a card be issued alongside your tax return to say this pass lets you go to the kiosk or turnstile and receive, you know, uh, subsidized or free yeah. um, cart. And does that happen anywhere in the world? Yeah. In fact, in Canada, we have uh, vibrant communities that are trying to do that. In fact, in Alberta, I believe there are two or three examples of that. In other Western cities in Canada, there are efforts to try and get that. Now, of course, as soon as you put a um, papahas, what we call uh, bureaucratic red tape in the mix, where people have to go, they have to make declarations, they have to prove. It adds a layer of bureaucracy to the whole thing. So it does make it more difficult uh, to manage and implement. It adds costs and administration costs and so on and so forth. And also it's a, um, you know, it's, how can I say? It, it, it creates barriers as well. So people will not do it because, uh, you know, they don't want to feel as though we're all there, you know. It, it creates barriers uh, to access. So, so yes, the answer is yes. Uh, vibrant communities, Google that uh, and have a look. Uh, check out, I believe Edmonton may have one. I know that Edmonton is also looking at free public transport, um, but I think Calgary has them. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly the cities that have these, but I, have, I did some research on that uh, last summer and um, I found a few examples. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe uh, if I can just uh, conclude with, with this question, unless we have others that come in. Um, in the case of Tallinn, the capital city of Estonia, what have the concrete um, kind of, uh, uh, what has been achieved in terms of either emissions reductions or modal transfer towards public transit, um, congestion, you know, in the city, uh, what kind of benefits can we expect from similar sized cities implementing? It's yeah. Okay. Such a solution. And, and, and here, here's, here's, a, a, here's the, the message I need to communicate. It is very, very hard to get people to get out of their cars. Okay, in, in the, the next, the, 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 in the city of Chengdu, uh, this is in the, there's a the little chapter, a little, uh, a little story in the book. And, and I'll, here, I'll just, I'll give you the punchline. The city of Chengdu tried to get people to get out of their cars at rush hours. So they made it free public transport from seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the morning absolutely zero uptake. And the head of the public transport authority who pushed out that solution said, we should have offered them free breakfast as well. Maybe that would have gotten them out of their cars. People, it's very, very, people are very, they, they love their cars. So it can, it, pricing is one strategy, but we're not going to achieve results if it's just pricing. It has to be increased service. It has to be increased quality of service. And we have to squeeze out access to private cars. It has to be a structural change. And the politics of that are extremely difficult. They're extremely difficult because people don't want to be pushed around. And yet, it seems that we have to do this if we want to change the way people move in our cities. So the results in Talon are interesting. We find um, the, 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 the collecting data, are, are they collecting the right kind of data? We, it's only been a few years so far, so it's hard to, it's too early to tell. Early signs are positive for talent, but uh, but but it, 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 you know, but let's not expect any miracles from this in, in in a very short term. It has to be done with a series of other things, reducing the number of parking places downtown very gently and slowly using Copenhagenized strategy, uh, reducing the number of uh, the, the size of roads and the number of roads coming downtown 
also super important. So it's, it's a whole cocktail of different measures that have to be done. And then we have... Uh, <laughs> not quite, <laughs> not quite. Um, uh, <laughs> and they have to be done yeah, very carefully. <laughs> and they have to be done very carefully because uh, you don't want to upset the political apple cart and get a reaction, a reactionary response. From it. So we all have to gently, slowly, fast implement dramatic change in our cities and welcome to the horrible, complicated problem that it is. It's a wicked problem. Indeed. But we've got to do something. We, so we'll keep trying. Yeah. Another policy option that has been suggested in the comment section is um, that uh, a tax, a downtown basically congestion tax. If you come in with a, within a certain perimeter, and this is happening in Germany, it's also happening in London. Um, I think Singapore is famously uh, the city, the place in the world that is doing this better than anywhere, anywhere else. And I think you're right in the sense that it's a suite of policies. Yeah. And uh, it's a carrot and a stick. So you can't just Absolutely. punish people and you can't just reward people. Um, when it comes to you know paying for public transit, there's got to be a stick somewhere else to say, hey, listen, it's going to cost you more if you want to drive alone downtown or whatever the case yeah. may be. Yeah. So there's re revenue coming in as, as part of the, the malice and there's uh, a bonus in the sense that you know these people could opt to pay nothing for, for their transportation uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. So thank you so much for those questions. Um, and uh, thank you, Jason, for being with us. Any closing uh, ideas to leave, uh, leave us with? Only that uh, wherever it's been implemented, free public transport is extremely popular. So get your politicians to recognize that fact and uh, mobilize the resources. The money is around. We, you know, we, we, we just need to put it in the right place. So, so let's kick out at least one good example in Canada. Let's try. Yeah, um, uh, just uh, that brings to mind this book called um, A Leap to an Ecological Economy that my book club right now is, uh, is working its way through. And one of the key recommendations of this book is uh, capital at zero or very, very low interest such that projects like this can see the light of day so mm -hmm. that national banks begin liberating capital, which they have done in the past through quantitative easing. They can... Is when, it, when, when the time comes, they can snap their fingers and make things happen. And mm. the climate uh, crisis is one of those times that it is necessary to create capital or to, to provide capital to projects that are going to have a uh, material impact on, on emissions uh, going forward. So that's, that's one of the uh, other possible solutions. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. The, the solutions could go on and on all, all evening. But thank you so much, Jason, for being with us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank, thank our audience and uh, the questions that, um, that they posed. And if you'd like to reach out to Jason, what is the easiest way for them uh, to reach you? Oh, you can send me an email, jason at jasonprince.ca. Great. I respond okay. to everything. I will put that in the, uh, in the notes on the YouTube channel where this will be posted. And that YouTube channel is, of course, Climate Reality Canada uh, YouTube. Thank you very much. Good night, Jason, and good night, Canada. Good night.